Hello and welcome to uh, Unit 5. In this unit we'll be discussing uh, uh, both momentum and energy. Uh, momentum is covered under Chapter 9 in the textbook, um, and then it will be followed by the uh, energy chapter. They have a lot in common uh, with the way that you approach the problems, even though they're really uh, very different languages of what I would say overall. Uh, first of all, we have to understand how this kind of fits into the grand scheme of things. So let's look at the next slide go back to our concept map and see how momentum fits in with what we've been doing so far. Okay, up to now we've been doing um, well, physics, um, but uh, we've, we've covered all these up, up top, right? We've talked about, you know, all these in the first, um, in the first units. Uh, we're still working on lab design as we go along and, you know, introducing more and more things. Um, and so the key things that we're, you know, most of this class is going to be mechanics. There's this little bit of extra at the end there. Um, as we've gone through, we started here in motion. We went through all of one-dimensional motion. You know, this is our, uh, you know, unit, uh, unit one stuff here. And then we got into two-dimensional motion, which got into uh, relative motion for one, projectile motion. Uh, again, we just had our midterm, so uh, if you should be recalling all that. Uh, then we talked about forces as the causes of, of motion uh, through acceleration, so land of forces and land of kinematics, and then, you know, acceleration is the, uh, the bridge between them. Uh, statics, when things do not accelerate. Uh, dynamics, when things do accelerate. And we went back and said, okay, let's look at rotational uh, situations and translate everything into that. Um, so now that we've got all of this taken care of, and again, you know, all of this is now done. So congratulations, uh, but now we're ready to move on to this half. So again, this does take a lot of ha a lot of time. You know, half of our um, our class is is on that left side, but now we're going to be moving to the right here. So momentum is going to be our first what I call alter alternate language. Uh, we can do some of the same things that we did here, uh, but we can do it with momentum uh, for certain situations, and we can do things that we couldn't do before. Uh, and energy will be another alternate language, and then we'll combine those back together um, when we get to repetitive motion, um, and we can talk about repetitive motion in terms of forces, motion, momentum, and energy. And we'll have the full, um, full repertoire, I guess you can say, of languages uh, that we can talk in. I say, you know, motion forces being a language, and momentum being a language, and energy being a language, um, and so we're just adding all those together to deal with uh, more complex situations like that. Okay, I describe uh, momentum as being our first alternate language that we'll learn, uh, alternate to uh, forces and uh, motion. Um, we will still use some concepts here, and actually they link together quite well with forces, uh, but it's just another way of looking at things. Uh, the key thing here is that we're going to have certain situations that this is going to be ideal for. Um, the number one thing is that Collisions. Collisions are, you know, as you know, when we want to deal with collisions, and the language that we need to use is momentum. So, uh, as we get uh, further and further, um, in a way, some things get easier because you have multiple ways to answer a problem. But it gets harder because you have to figure out what's the best way, and collisions will uh, will help with that. Uh, it's very you know, the thinking um, really comes to uh, both this and an energy you have to start having a before and after thinking. Uh, so, you know, like you hit a pause button, you think, okay, what's going on now? Uh, then you hit the play button, and then you let it go, and then you hit pause again, and then you say, okay, what's going on now? And this before and after thinking is something that we have to get used to in this unit because uh, it's really going to be helpful for both momentum and energy. Um, and some, in a lot of ways, it can make it... Um, less complex and sometimes it's more complex so sometimes it's easier just to do a kinematic of a free fall or something else like that uh, but the one thing that is uh, that is important that kind of gets introduced in this section is you know defining what a system is we did that a little bit um, at the end of forces but it's going to be very important here uh, about what is a system is it closed is there outside things coming in uh, to the system So the word momentum is actually probably the one word that get used in our common speech a little bit more than things like velocity 
or forces or acceleration or something else like that. Uh, but momentum, you know, it does get used, um, you know, for especially in sports, um, you know, talking about more intangible things like teams got momentum, things like that. Um, but uh, the key thing is that if you're, you know, let's just take the sports thing. And, I, you know, I like to think of a, a big football player or something else like that. Um, you know, so you get a big, you get a big uh, linebacker, running back or somebody else like that, you know, barreling towards you. Um, to be honest, I'm afraid of that, you know, large football player uh, because that football player has a significant amount of mass. And uh, well, I'm not afraid if he's, you know, big and, you know, massive. And, uh, and if I, uh, uh, if he's standing still, I'm not afraid of him. Um, but if he's, you know, running towards me at a high speed, then I'm afraid of him. Uh, likewise, if it's somebody coming at me at a high speed, uh, but it's like a peewee football player, then maybe I'm not as afraid. But I'm really afraid of momentum overall. Momentum uh, can be a scary thing uh, when you know it's against you. So what momentum is depends on mass and the speed. And it's a, the easiest equation that we have almost um, is that it's just you multiply the mass times the speed. Um, actually, the correction in this case, this is a velocity. So you notice the vector symbol here. We need it's a mass times a velocity, not necessarily a speed. Um, and you can see here we use the uh, p, uh, lowercase p for momentum. It goes back to some old um, you know Latin root or something like that that uh, Newton uh, set forward. And again, we can't use lowercase m for momentum because that's mass. Uh, we can't use capital M because it's kind of omega, or not uh, omega, but mega, um, and so on. Uh, again, if this is masses in kilograms and this is in meters per second, then we get this kind of odd unit here of a kilogram meter per second. Uh, there's no shortcut on that, um, like a newton or a joule or a watt that we'll learn later. Uh, it's just a kilogram meter per second. On the broader level, uh, momentum is also described as... Um, inertia in motion. Um, so um, if you take Newton's first law, things in motion want to stay in motion, things at rest want to stay at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. The, the uh, inertia in motion part, the fact that things want to continue in, in uh, moving um, is really what momentum is. The in, um, inertia in motion specifically. So one of the key things to keep in mind is that uh, momentum is a vector. Um, it has a magnitude and direction. If you look here, uh, velocity is a vector. It has a magnitude and direction. And what happens when I multiply a vector times a scalar? Again, mass is just a scalar. Um, well, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't change the direction of the vector. It just makes it grow or shrink. Like this mass is you know greater than 1 than the momentum you know is greater than the velocity if the mass is less than one then the momentum value is less than the velocity uh, but it doesn't change the direction so the key thing is it has a magnitude and direction and that momentum is in the same direction as velocity so if i'm going you know 10 meters per second north that's the direction of my velocity uh, it's also the direction of my momentum i can't have a different direction um, unlike, you know, acceleration and velocity, which, you know, can be anything. So um, vectors at angles, we have to go back to that. Uh, we've been out of that with rotation for a while, uh, but we're going back to vectors at angles and the fact that, you know, I hate vectors at angles. And I'm going to have to break it up into an X component and a Y component uh, if needed. Uh, we're gonna, going to kind of minimize that a little bit in this section. So let's go through some examples here. Um, okay, uh, how much momentum does a 1,500-kilogram car have that's traveling 55 miles an hour? Um, okay, so I know, let's see, get my zoom in here. I know that um, you know, mom momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So let's see, is, can it be this simple? Let's, yeah, it can actually be this simple. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, my mass is 1,500 kilograms, and my velocity is given as ooh, 55 miles an hour. Let's let's change this. Um, I happen to know because I need that in meters per second. So I happen to know if I divide by 2.2, .2, uh, 
uh, then I'll get um, you know the answer in meters per second. So uh, roughly that comes out to be. Uh, hold on one second. Roughly 25 meters per second. Okay, so that's what I have to use because my unit for momentum is kilograms meters per second. So I have to have kilograms and I have to have meters per second. So this is 20. Uh, sorry, uh, 25. Uh, meters per second. So that's uh, 25 times 1500. So this is a momentum of 37,500 kilogram, oops, uh, erase that, kilogram meters per second. All right, so that's a significant amount. That's a, uh, you know, that's, that's a car. You know, so I'm afraid of cars that are going 55 miles an hour. So that's a lot of momentum, and it's a lot of stuff to be afraid of. So let's go through uh, these next ones, and I'll kind of uh, set things up and uh, kind of skip ahead here. Okay, the bullet um, has a mass of 52 grams. I need to convert that to kilograms because, again, my unit for momentum is kilogram meters per second. And it's traveling at 882 meters per second. Oh, that's fast. So 882 is what I need to put in here. I don't need to convert that or anything. And I get, let's see, I get 45, I'll say 45.9. And again, that unit is kilograms, meters per second. Okay, so significantly less than the car, but it makes sense. Um, but I am also afraid of bullets, um, you know, for uh, kind of other reasons. But, you know, uh, yeah, I'm afraid of bullets. Uh, that's actually a decent amount of momentum. Um, but a bullet's pretty small and it, you know, has pressure at a very specific point. So, uh, and let's do the last one. Let's find a, the momentum of a big train. So, again, I'm going to do... Uh, momentum is mass times velocity. In this case, my mass is 100,000. And my velocity, well, it's at rest. So my velocity is zero. So, okay, so I actually have zero momentum. So if you don't move, you can't have any momentum. If you have no mass, you have no momentum. Um, so the key thing is, you know, just because you have mass doesn't mean that uh, you have momentum. Okay, so the uh, actual um, momentum idea is pretty easy. Something that's moving and it has speed uh, or velocity has momentum. Um, easy to calculate and multiply it. All you have to think of about is kilograms and then meters per second. Um, but when we actually start looking at, okay, let's see, um, something has a change in momentum. Um, something was going slow and then it was going faster or something that is moving and then comes to a stop. Um, we talked about that before uh, in forces in motion and we kind of linked those together that a force caused a change in speed or a change in velocity or change in direction. And it's very similar to this. Um, but in this case, uh, we're going to go through a situation where we no longer need uh, we no longer need acceleration. Um, we no longer need kinematics. Um, we can actually look at things a little bit separately, a little bit differently, and um, and solve it solve it differently. So the situation we're going to look at here is like if I, if I take a soccer ball here, and the soccer ball is initially at rest. Okay. Um, somebody comes along and kicks the soccer ball. So what's happening is that there is a, uh, initially as the ball is right there, there's a force that's being applied onto the soccer ball. Um, but if I really watch what's happening, like frame by frame, uh, that soccer ball is no longer round here. Uh, then it goes back to being round. There's actually a, a, a bit, a chunk right here that gets compressed. And so what actually happens during that time is that force actually grows to be greater when it's at maximum compression. And then when it rebounds back, it goes back to like a normal thing. So, you know, so kind of these two are very similar. 
and here you have a maximum amount of force. Uh, but the key thing is that if I want to move something, and this is something we already knew, uh, that is at rest, I must apply a force. Uh, and in particular, in, in this unit, we're going to focus on a force over a certain amount of time. Okay, so I, it's not just a force, but a force over a certain amount of time. So in the example of that soccer ball, um, we can have the opposite thing happen. Well, let's say, what, the, what if the ball is moving and the uh, person is not? And this is a you know, nasty situation here. Again, this ball wants to be round like this, and this guy's face wants to go you know, like that. Uh, but you can see there's a, quite a bit of compression going on. So during that time, the soccer ball was going this way, all right, and then after it bounces, it's going to be going that way afterwards. Uh, so this person's face has to apply a force. Uh, but it's not a constant force. Uh, the more and more that ball is compressed, um, then the more and more force that there is. So as the you know, ball gets compressed more and more, there's more and more force. Uh, then the ball starts bouncing and regaining its shape back the other way. And then, um, yeah, so, but, the, but there's a, ma a maximum amount of force at this maximum amount of compression. Now, what we can do here is we could, you know, we could use this complex force here, right? The idea that one, uh, an idea that this changes all, all the time. Um, or let's see if this is eight, uh, 800 here, then the average force over the amount of time is this. You know, this right here is an average force. About, you know, if this is 800, then about 400, right? Because what this curve like this looks like is it looks like a triangle. Uh, we can actually use that approximation too. So if I want to change something's momentum, let's say it is moving to the right at a significant speed and I want to make it move to the left uh, at another significant speed. Imagine a uh, baseball and a baseball bat, right? So if a baseball is moving to the right at a significant speed, I want to hit it and make it go the other way at a significant speed. I'm going to have to apply a force to the left. Um, and the more force that I apply, uh, the more change I get in its momentum, right? Again, um, if it was going to the right and it's going, then it's going to the left, then that's a significant change in velocity, right? Um, so I need to apply a greater force. Uh, the other thing is that the longer, right, the longer in duration that I apply the force, uh, the more momentum I get. Uh, so let's say um, if I wanted to uh, push a box down the, the hallway, I could push with a thousand newtons. But if I did that for one second, um, you know, I'd you know I wouldn't get as much change in momentum as if I did it for two minutes, you know, um, or even ten seconds or anything else like that. So I not only need to apply force, but I need to apply a force for a longer amount of time to get more change in momentum. Which is why in sports, you know, it's often, you know, every, you know almost every contact type sport, they always say uh, follow through, you know, follow through in golf and tennis and baseball. Because um, you want to maximize the amount of time that you apply the force while in contact with the object. So when I combine the ideas of both force, the amount of force I apply to something, and the amount of time that I apply that force, I get a, uh, a kind of a summary concept called impulse, right? The combination of amount of force and time duration is called impulse. And we use a capital J, right, to uh, indicate impulse. So, you know, like in golf, when you follow through and you, you know, when you follow through, that maximizes the amount of time. Um, that your force, right, you know, and if you maximize this, the amount of force, I'm sorry, if you swing with a certain amount of force and then you maximize the amount of time, you give the ball the most impulse that you can, right? So impulse is force times time, um, you know, so you can maximize that impulse by either increasing the force or by increasing the time. Um, now, if I look at you know, something simple like this, let's say I make a plot, that's force and time, and if I apply a constant force over a certain amount of time, um, then uh, in this graph, okay, well, what is this constant force and what is this time? You know, you can use that to calculate the impulse. 
or if I look at this, then the area under the curve, as we've been using, also shows that too. That there's a certain amount of force for a certain amount of time. My height is in force. My width is in time. Uh, you know, length times width is the area, which is the same as that. Uh, we can also do the same thing um, with any other kind of shape. And so what we do, we, we, if we take something like we saw this complex when the soccer ball, you know, you know, has compresses and you have maximum amount in back, uh, what we can do is we can approximate this as essentially a triangle, right? It's, it's pretty close. That's fair for this class. Of course, if you were uh, doing the calculus things, you know, you'd take the integral of f of t dt, right, and that would be equal to the, you know, impulse, right? And that's, you know, that's fine for them. But, I mean, otherwise, we just, you know, take the area under the curve the same way we've been doing before. You know, again, we can look at more and more complex shapes if we wanted to, um, you know, something like, uh, actually, even, even, you know, positives and negatives, right? So we have force, it goes like this, and then it comes out like that, and then flattens out. Uh, and again, it's the area under the curve for these, you know, what we'd say triangles and squares, right, with this being positive, this being negative, all that kind of stuff. So same thing we were doing in, um, you know, kinematics here that we're kind of repeating here with this area under the curve. Uh, impulse is a vector, so if the force is to the right, then the impulse is to the right. If the force is to the left, then the impulse is to the left. And then, again, the more amount of time that, you know, that uh, force is applied, the more amount of impulse. But really what you're doing when you apply an impulse, which is a force, is you're changing something's um, velocity. Right? Accelerations come from net forces, what we said in the past. Now we're going to say that changes in velocities, we're not going to call them accelerations, we're going to call them changes in velocities. Changes are also changes in momentum. And that changes in momentum come from impulses or forces that are applied over a certain amount of time. So we can link those two together and, um, you know, and get this right here. This is called the impulse momentum theorem. Okay? That, uh, oh yeah, and keep in mind that you know, this right here uh, on the left side is uh, force times time, which is impulse. So this is maybe the, the better way to write everything together, is that impulse is equal to force times time, which is equal to the change in momentum. So if something doesn't have momentum, and then it does have momentum, then I have changed it because I applied a force over a certain amount of time. And uh, the other was, you know, something does have momentum and then it stops having momentum, which means I have to apply a certain amount of force over a certain amount of time or give it an impulse is another way to say that. And I kind of lied to you a bit when I said that uh, this is a completely different language than um, uh, forces, uh, because actually this is the language that Newton wrote uh, the laws with. He talked about, you know, momentum, essentially, um, you know, an object's inertia and changing of that inertia. So if you actually look at this, this is what I just wrote with this being delta P right here. I'll write that out. Um, well, let's say final momentum is mass times final velocity. Initial momentum is mass times initial velocity. Uh, the masses are common, so I can factor out the mass. And I get this. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is true here, uh, but what if I take, uh, let's see, I'll take this mass, divide it, uh, keep it on, actually keep that on that side, but oh, here, delta T, I move delta, divide both sides by delta T, I get this, and essentially this is what we teach now, we teach F equals MA, but in reality, um, um, you know, this is the language that he wrote uh, that in. And just as we know that F equals MA is not really a thing, that this needs to be net force. Um, this also, for impulse here, needs to be a net, you know, a net force uh, here, you know, the sum of all the forces or whatever. You know, if you have multiple forces acting on something, it's not that individual force that changes momentum, but the, the, the net that does. 
So let's do this example here. Um, a rubber ball experiences the force shown in the graph as it bounce, bounces off the floor. And again, in reality, it would you know look like you know, some kind of curve like this. But again, we can approximate it with a triangle, and that's fine. And the question is, what is the impulse um, of the ball? Uh, so what do we know so far? We know that impulse is equal to force times time. Okay. And, okay, so the question is, uh, what's the force applied to it? Well, that force actually is changing. So I don't have a clean way to just pop something in right there. Okay, so um, if I do use something, then this, use, this needs to be two things. It needs to be an average force, and it must be a net force. Okay, so that's my two things to use right there. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, the impulse, well, impulse we also learned was in a force versus time graph is going to be the area. Okay, so I need to find this area, and it's going to be positive. Um, okay, so I need to use my area equation. So area, um, in this case, equals one-half base times height for this triangle. Uh, one-half my base, which is ooh, uh, eight, <coughs> 8 milliseconds. So that's eight thousandth of a second. So I need this to be in seconds. So I need to go one two, three, zero in front of that. So my base needs to be 0 0.008. And then my height is 300. And that equals 1.2, this would be a kilogram meter per second. Impulse has the same units, of course, as... Um, as momentum, um, because if, if a force is a newton, which is really a kilogram meter per second squared, and time is in seconds, then one of those seconds cancel, and I get kilogram meters per second. Uh, also notice um, that I have one half right here, and I have 300 right here. So uh, in this case, since this is a triangle and it's symmetric, um, all that, then um, I can actually use, if I wanted to, I could use an average force of 150. And I would get the same you know, thing. If I got the area of this, the area of that square right there um, is the same as uh, the area of that triangle um, based off of this, this idea right here. Uh, next example, uh, see a baseball is thrown at a speed of 200. 20 meters per second, hits straight back towards the pitcher at a speed of 40 meters per second. Um, okay, what is the average force the bat exerts on the ball? What is the maximum force the bat exerts on the ball? Okay, so, um, okay, let's look at this. Um, first of all, notice that we're on the positive side uh, here. <clears throat> so I'm going to say that um, initially... Uh, we have to start setting up our before and afters here. Um, so let's say initially what happens is that the ball, let's go to blue, actually black. Initially the ball is moving to the left at 20 meters per second. We know that the mass of the ball was, um, I think, 150 grams, which is going to be um, 0 0.15 kilograms. And then afterwards, so this is my before. And then after, uh, what happens? Well, now the ball is moving, let's see, to the right at, uh, let's see, to, to the right at 40 meters per second. And so, 40. And again, it's the same mass before and after. So if I notice here, this had a momentum to the left, um, right here in the before, and then it had a momentum to the right. So there's been some kind of change in momentum. So that's what I'm going to have to use here um, as I go forward. So that means that the change in momentum 
is equal to um, the force times time. This is an average net force here, is really what that is. And that's also equal to the impulse. Um, okay, so this is the impulse momentum. Uh, I'm not really being asked to find the impulse here, so I can kind of forget that part here, and let's just concentrate on this. Um, so what do I know? Uh, I know this is final momentum minus initial, because change is always final minus initial. And um, I have average force, and this is uh, the amount of time. Okay, so let's see, what do I know? Uh, initially, actually, let's say finally, it is moving to the right, so it's going in a positive 40, positive 40 uh, meters per second to the right, um, and its mass was 0 0.15 kilograms. And I subtract away its initial momentum. Okay, so initially it had a mass of 0 0.15, and it was going to left at negative 20 uh, meters per second. Again, that negative is important because that shows it's going to the left. Okay, and that is going to be equal to the average force, which we are trying to find, times the amount of time. Okay, let's go over the graph here and find our time. So 0.6 milliseconds. So again, that's a small contact time, so it's 0.6 milliseconds. So I'm going to have to move that uh, an additional 1, 2, 3, period, 0, 0, 0. So it's point zero 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 six. Okay, so let's go back over. Point zero 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 six. Apologize for that. Make sure I have three zeros. Yep, okay. And um, so let's start simplifying here. And I went ahead and solved it. So um, an average force of 15,000 newtons is required to um, uh, on the ball in order to change it. And it's a small, small, small amount of time. And again, um, again, a very, very small amount of time. So you need a large amount of force in order to change its momentum drastically in that small amount of time. Um, okay, so that's 15,000 newtons, uh, but it says, now the second question is, what's the maximum force? Um, okay, so let's see, 15,000 newtons is the average force. If this is a triangle, just as we just saw in the last one, then the area of a triangle uh, is one half base times height, um, which is the same as the base times one half the height, which is another way of saying that this area is the same as that area, um, with the idea that right here this is fifteen, this would be fifteen thousand newtons, which means right here must be thirty thousand newtons. Okay, and you could have you could have matched up. Uh, you could have said that, okay, 15,000 newtons is the force, or you could have found, I'm oh, sorry, you could have found, um, you could have found the, okay, you could have used this right side here, right, um, the change in momentum, um, and found this, and said that has to be equal to the impulse, and the impulse is the area under the curve of the triangle, and you could have set those together, but again, uh, we can also just look at things and say, oh, okay, this is a triangle, that's a square, uh, these two areas are the same, um, and let's just do a shortcut. Okay, for our next situation, we have um, a situation where a 100-gram rubber ball is thrown down to a hard floor that strikes the floor with a speed of 11 meters per second. Uh, estimate the height of the ball's bounce. So the first thing I'm going to do is come down here, and I'm going to... Let's draw this out. Let's draw this picture down here where we've got some space. And uh, I'm going to pause it here. I'm going to draw, and then I'll come back. Okay, so here's my drawing of the situation. Um, so my, I'm going to break it up into three ideas um, before, I guess, the initial part. I'm going to hit pause, right, when it's hitting the ground, right before it hits the ground. Um, I'm told that it's going 11 meters per second. So my initial 
velocity at that point is 11 meters per second. But it's also going down, and I really have to keep track of directions in this chapter. So this is going to be negative, negative 11 meters per second. And what happens after, or while it's hitting, there's going to be an upward force. All right, so there's an upward force, and that's what's shown in the graph. Uh, and it's going to take a certain amount of time for that ball to compress. That force is going to grow as it compresses, and it's going to shrink as it pushes back up. And again, all of that's what's given in the graph. Um, and then it's going to have some kind of final velocity, which I don't know at what speed it leaves the ground as it goes back up. Uh, after that, it travels upwards. And of course, we know that weight pulls it down, but it's going to reach some kind of height uh, right there. And um, what this final final <laughs> velocity will be is going to be zero. Okay, so es essentially we have kind of multiple phases. With this part right here, um, oh, I, you know, that's a delta y, and it's going to be in free fall. Um, so I'm going to be, ha be able to handle that with kinematics. Um, again, sometimes we have to go, you know, back to that if we want. Um, you know, and... Um, Actually, I could use impulse momentum theorem there, too, if I knew time, but I don't know time. I'm looking for height, so kinematics will be the best. So this, this will blend a couple things here together. But we're going to concentrate uh, initially on this part right here, um, and uh, so we can uh, understand uh, the impulse that happens on change in momentum. So let's, uh, let's zoom back out and get back to the normal part here. Um, let's see. So, um, let's see, okay, I'm giving this graph right here, 800 newtons. Uh, let's see, I can actually take this, and it has a little curve to it, but again, for this class, we approximate it looking like a little triangle right there. And I can do, if I wanted to, I could find that area. And let's start with that statement right there, what, how everything's related. That the impulse, which is the area under the curve, uh, equals the force, and this is an average force, times time, which is also equal to the change in momentum, which is momentum final minus momentum initial. So let's uh, have a couple options. I'm going to do the, you know, for impulse, I'm going to use the area under the curve. Um, and that area, let's go find it uh, over here by the curve, uh, is going to be uh, one-half base times height. And I need that base to be in seconds, so zero point, I go over one, two, three, and zero point zero zero five, and, oh, that's a five, and uh, times the height, which is 800 newtons. And when I do that, I get a, a total of two. Uh, which is a two units of impulse, which is the same as momentum kilogram meters per second. So I know that my impulse is two kilogram meters per second. I just use it as two. Um, and so right now I don't need this information because what I really want to try to find is what is its final momentum right here. Um, again, that that I, I could have used these. I could have used an average force, which would have been. 400 or something, and then time period, but that's okay. Um, so my final momentum is the mass uh, times the final velocity minus the mass, and my initial momentum is mass times the initial velocity. Uh, and again, my impulse is 2, so let's keep that. So my mass is 100 grams, which is 0 0.1 kilograms, times final velocity, minus the mass, which is 0 0.1 times... Uh, the initial velocity, which is negative uh, 11 uh, meters per second. And so what I can go, now I have one unknown, and that is this final velocity here. Okay, and what I find is that I have a final uh, velocity of 9 meters per second as it go, launches back up from the floor um, right there. And then I go back to my, you know, what's going on around here. Um, okay, so... That was my after. I know, so I know now this is, you know, nine meters per second. It's going to be positive up, and uh, then I can, in order to find uh, this delta y, what height it goes to, um, then I can play the kinematic equation game with this now being my 
initial velocity for this part, you know, right here. So we had kind of two separate things. And so uh, we're going to use kinematics here to find that. So let's go over here. I know that uh, uh, initial velocity in y is uh, 9 meters per second. I know acceleration in y is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. My final velocity in y um, is 0. And I need to find delta y. So that's going to be, let's see, equation of, uh, let's see, 2 acceleration delta y uh, equals final velocity uh, squared minus initial velocity squared. So 2 times negative 9.8 uh, times delta y, which we're trying to solve for. My final velocity is 0, and my initial velocity is 9. So it's going to be uh, 9 uh, squared, 81, divided by 2 times 9.8. The negatives will go away. And so I get a delta y of 4.13 meters with 3 sig figs. Okay. So the key thing here is that this was given as a force versus time graph right here. Um, and that could give me an impulse, uh, which I use as an area under the curve. And that's equal to the change in momentum. Um, and given that, I could find the final velocity as it leaves the ground. And after that, I could use kinematics um, to find the final height. Now that we're back into the land of uh, vectors, we have to start thinking about the, uh, the x's and y's a little bit better. Uh, because this is a two-dimensional uh, thing, we're back into you know, land of vectors. Um, and so uh, I can not only have a change of momentum in x, but I could also have a change in momentum uh, in, in y. Um, so each one, I could have a change in each dimension, or just one and not the other. Uh, but I can isolate it either way, just using you know sine and cosine the way we've done in the past. Uh, which means I can also have an impulse in x, or I can have an impulse in y. Uh, again, it doesn't... Um, it doesn't really matter uh, in this case. Uh, we just got to treat them separately. And as long as we keep track of our x's and y's separately, maybe bring them back together, we're okay. Again, we're not going to be doing this too much in the class, but we do need to, to kind of understand it going forward. All right, so 5-kilogram bowling ball moving east at 2 meters per second is hit by a mallet swinging north. The mallet exerts 200 newtons of force for a tenth of a second. What is the final momentum of the bowling ball? It's very important in these that you, um, you think of or at least draw uh, before and after style pictures um, to see what's going on. So I'm going to pause here, draw a picture uh, for before, and draw a picture uh, for after, and then describe those. Okay, here's my before picture. I have a 5-kilogram bowling ball moving to the right, or sorry, to the east at 2 meters per second. Well, the mallet is coming uh, north, and it's going to strike at 200 newtons, and again, uh, for a tenth of a second. And so now I've got to think about what's going to happen afterwards. Well, first of all, I've got to keep, in, uh, keep the idea that this force here is only in Y. Okay? It's only in Y. It's not, giving, it's not pushing this thing right and left. It's only pushing it, um, I'm sorry, east or west. It's only pushing it north. Um, so if you remember back to our you know, relative velocity or two-dimensional things like that, then, you know, these are two separate things that don't really affect each other. So what happens afterwards is that bowling ball still is traveling, you know, essentially two meters per second uh, east, but it will also now travel north at the same time. So let's look at what that looks like for an after picture. Okay, for an after picture, after this force has been applied, uh, it's no longer touching it. Uh, that tenth of a second has already passed. Uh, what happens is that five kilogram ball is not going to go just north because it still has to go two meters per second, uh, you know, east. It just additionally is also going north now. So what actually goes off is at some diagonal, you know, at some unknown, you know, angle here. Um, but, you know, fundamentally what's still going on is that this is still moving 
you know, at two meters per second this way, it just happens to be also moving, you know, at some additional, you know, speed, you know, this way. So I need to find what this final velocity in y is, essentially, you know, what this, you know, what that is. Um, I know two meters per second doesn't change, but I need to know what this is in order to understand what this total, you know, final velocity will be right here. Okay, so let's go to the, uh, the math and let's get back to the problem here. Um, okay, so, so I, you know, let's, let's say my impulse in x. So let's look at my impulse in x is equal to my force in x times time, uh, which is equal to the change in momentum. Which I'm going to start writing my change of momentums as, um, you know, final minus initial. It just kind of skips a step, and I'm okay with that. Okay. <clears throat> so, well, actually, hold on. Uh, I My force in x, um, this force right here is not in x at all. It is just in y. So this is 0, which makes my impulse 0, which makes my change of momentum 0. So, again, that's why it has no change in momentum in x, it's only in y. So that's zero, and I'm okay with that. So, all right, but let's concentrate just in the y now, because again, we can you know think of things separately. That's equal to the force in y times the time, uh, which is equal to the change in momentum. I apologize, these need to be x's right here. Uh, and change in momentum, so final in y minus initial in y. Um, oh, let me change that. Mess that up. And let's see, let's go back here. So this is a, yeah, initial in y. Okay, um, so, but that's not equal to zero because I have some kind of force. So let's see, let's, we, we don't need this right here, so we're just going to look at this part right here. My force in y was 200 newtons. And my time was a tenth of a second. Uh, my final momentum is my mass, which is 5 kilograms, times my final velocity in y. And uh, minus uh, my initial velocity in y, which was 5. Okay, so what was my initial momentum in y is equal to my mass times initial velocity in y which it was actually zero, okay? So it actually was not moving. It was only moving uh, horizontally to begin with. It was only horizontal, so there was no vertical part to it. So that's going to be zero, zero right there. So that goes to zero. So this is going to be 200 times 0 0.1, so that's 20 divided by 5. So my final velocity in y is 4 meters per second, okay? So now if I go back over here, as, like I said right here, I have some kind of final velocity. Um, oh, correction. Um, we're not actually looking for the final mo Well, let's, let's go ahead and do that. That's, that's fine. Um, this is asking for the final momentum of the ball. If I can find the final velocity, then I just multiply it by the mass, and I'm okay. So, okay, so let's see. Um, I know that it's still moving 2 meters per second this way, but now it's also moving... 4 meters per second this way. And so what I need to do is find that final velocity with the idea that that is a, a vector, which means a magnitude and direction. And I'll do probably better if I start zooming in here uh, with my writing skills here. So um, that means uh, the final velocity is, we got to use Pythagorean theorem, uh, 4 squared plus uh, 2 squared uh, which is be the square root of uh, 20. Uh, see, the square root of 20 is 4.47 <clears throat> meters per second. Uh, to find my angle, I need to use inverse tan, and that's going to be 4 over 2, and let's find what that is. Uh, 63.4 degrees. Um, but again, I'm asked for momentum, so uh, that's going to be final momentum is mass times final velocity. So mass is 5, um, 
my final velocity is 4.47 at 63 degrees, and this would actually be, um, so from that it would be north of east. So I 4.47 times 5. Uh, so my final momentum is 22.4 kilogram meters per second at 63.4 degrees north of east. Final, final, final. Okay, so um, in this class, we're not going to go too far down this two-dimensional momentum thing. Again, when uh, in other classes, or I don't know why, but it's just limiting uh, here is that um, you'd have fancy collisions at angles, a full, like, imagine a full billiard ball, you know, t uh, you know, pool table or whatever, and all the two-dimensional collisions that go on. You'd have to separate your X's and Y's and keep track of your X's and keep track of your Y's, so on and so on. But we're not going to go uh, into that depth. So if we back up for a little bit um, and talk about what we just learned, impulse and momentum, it actually has a very, very, very far-reaching um, application. And uh, it's very important, not just sports, but anything safety-related and even biological. Uh, so to say, you know, baseball players, golf ball, uh, sorry, golf ball, uh, golf um, and uh, tennis and everything else like that, you're taught to follow through. Because when you follow through, you maximize the amount of contact time. And if you maximize the amount of contact time, then that force that you can apply can times that time will give you a greater impulse, a greater change in momentum of the object, of the golf ball, of the tennis ball, of the baseball, anything else like that, which is why you follow through in sports. But for safety, you want the opposite thing to happen. If your car has momentum, which is a lot of momentum as we calculated, um, then if you get into a wreck or something bad happens, uh, that momentum needs to change or will change. You will go from a whole bunch of momentum to rest, uh, otherwise known as zero momentum. So there is a change in momentum. And if you have to wreck, then that's going to happen no matter what. But what you can change is the amount of time it takes to, for that momentum to change. So if you can maximize the amount of time it takes to change that momentum, that means it actually requires less force in order for that car to stop. Less force means less damage or maybe less damage to you. So everything from water barrels on the on the uh, highway or interstate to uh, airbags to seat belts to crumple zones, everything that you see there um, actually contributes to the idea of um, uh, maximum, you know, the momentum impulse, maximizing the amount of time so that the um, force is minimized. Uh, even uh, you have, you know, rams, you know, that butt heads and stuff like that. And uh, they actually have um, fluid in their brain that actually provides a cushion um, that allows that force to be minimized so their brain isn't damaged while they're doing whatever they do for why, you know, how, why they do it, I don't know. So. Next, we're going to get into our first uh, real conservation thing about this class. And conservation is going to be the key, 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 key part to this unit of uh, momentum and energy. Um, it's also the first time we're really going to have to concentrate hard on our definition of a system. Okay, So in general, we're going to draw these kind of red lines around things to define a system, right? which means that those are the only two things I'm concentrating on. If there's anything that else that affects that system, it comes from outside of that system, and we'll have to think about that. So if we look at Newton's third law um, as a introduction here, uh, we get the idea that, um, that let's see, if, uh, if they are touching each other during this time, the amount of force applied this way is equal to the amount of force applied this way. Newton's third law says that. Um, well, okay, if they're touching each other and they're applying that same force, uh, one cannot apply the force greater and one cannot apply the force for a greater amount of time. So they have the equal amounts of, um, <clears throat> of what we have here, which is impulse. 
just in opposite directions. So we can make the statement that the impulse of one and the impulse of two are the same, except for you know opposite, you know opposite directions. One's positive, one's negative. So my changeable momentums are the same. I can go for that. Okay, my you know this must be equal to this, right? But uh, but an opposite. I go from there, and I keep on going. And what it shows is that my eventually when you put everything on one side, initial, all the initials on one side and all the finals on the other one, that my f initial momentum right, of the system must be equal to my final momentum of the system. And my, again, my system is you know, object one and object two. So the total amount of momentum on you know, my before, this is my before, has to be equal to my total amount of momentum in my after, you know, my final, my after, however you want to say that. Um, so it's it's a, it's a key thing, it's, and it's important to um, to remember that um, my befores must be equal to my afters, and that's one of the, the key concepts of of conservation. So this, get, so this gets summarized as saying that the total momentum before has to be equal to the total momentum after for a closed system. Uh, typically what we talk about is collisions. I mean, collisions um, are kind of what happened, um, but it can just be you know, any interaction uh, between two objects in the system. Um, again, for a closed system without anything from the outside interfering or changing anything, if it did, if there was a force from the outside on the system, then that would be an impulse, right? And so your, you know, your momentum of the system would change. So, but for a closed system, if we just concentrate on two objects or something else like that, and they have a collision or an interaction, the total momentum before must be equal to the total momentum afterwards. So if I calculate the momenta of each one, right, initially and I add them together, you know, then and I calculate the momentum of each one afterwards and I add them together, right, then those must be the same for a closed system without any outside forces acting on it. Correction, outside net forces acting on it. So here's the good thing about this. All right, you have a collision there, an interaction that happens that can actually be pretty complex to describe. You know, one thing is exerting a force on another at the same amount of time. We went through all that derivation there. But if you, if you can isolate it down to this, then it actually makes things a lot simpler. And it's an easier way to think about things uh, than forces and accelerations. And so if I look at this, during a collision, I can calculate the, you know, the velocity before and the velocities after. I do not need to use forces at all between those two objects. I do not need to find accelerations. There's no acceleration bridge between kinematics and forces. There's no time that's required um, to understand how long they're in contact. No kinematics at all. The only thing you have to do is keep track of directions. So it's, it's much more simple, simpler for these situations, but your one responsibility is to essentially keep track of directions and do your algebra one correctly. So here's our example. Uh, two ice skaters stand at rest facing each other on frictionless ice. So there's no friction on the ice. One skater has a mass of 45 kilograms. The other one has a mass of 80 kilograms. They push off on one another. After the push, the 45 kilogram skater has a velocity of 2.2. What is the speed of the other skater? So a key thing here is that we have to do befores and afters. Befores and afters. So let's do that picture here of a before, and then we'll do a picture of an after. Okay, so here's my before. I have a 45 kilogram skater and an 80 kilogram skater. Um, I'm pretending that I'm taking like a bird's eye view uh, on this. And uh, so what's going to happen is that they are going to exert a force on each other. They're going to push on each other, which means this one exerts a force here. This one exerts the same amount back. Newton's third law says it must be the same. If this force is the same and the time is the same, then it's an impulse. 
you know, so this impulse must be equal to this impulse. And so what's going to happen afterwards is, afterwards the 45 kilogram skater is going to move to the left, and the 80 kilogram skater is going to move to the right. Um, also, we know that because um, the masses are different, then the acceleration of the 45 kilogram skater will be greater. So it should be going faster afterwards for equal amount of force than the 80 kilogram skater here. But we're going to look at it not with forces and accelerations, but with momenta, uh, momentum in general. So, um, okay, so let's set this up uh, mathematically. Uh, we know that, um, let's see, what do we know? We know that afterwards, the 45 kilogram skater uh, has, a, uh, has a velocity, I think it was, of 2.2 uh, meters per second. So this is 2.2 meters per second. All right, so let's go over here and, um, and then deal with this. So I'll say my total momentum before, um, so my total momentum before is going to be the, um, the uh, yeah, sum of my momentum's initial equals the sum of my momentum's final. Um, momentum initial is mass times initial velocity of object one. All right, plus mass times uh, of object two times initial velocity of object two, uh, plus mass times, uh, sorry, that equals to the afterwards the mass of um, object one with its final velocity of object one, and then the mass of object two with the final velocity of object two. Um, okay, so my total momentum on the left has to be equal to my total momentum on the right. So, okay, let's start plugging things in. This is, uh, say, object one is the 45 kilogram skater. So it's 45. And initially it has a, oh, it's at rest. They're both at rest. So actually, I'm going to go ahead and plug that in. Uh, so they actually have zero momentum to begin with. Okay, so you can say, oh, okay, this is nice and done. Uh, then they have to have zero momentum afterwards or zero velocity afterwards. And the answer is no, they do not have to have zero velocity afterwards. They have to have a total of zero momentum afterwards, which means when I keep track of this and I go through the rest of the process, this 45 kilogram skater is going at 2.2 meters per second, but specifically going to the left at 2.2. So actually that skater has a negative momentum, which means when I add the uh, skater 2's momentum afterwards, which I know is going to the right, that'll be positive. And all it says is that when I add those together, it has to be 0 afterwards. So 80 here, and then this has to be some unknown thing, but I know it's going to have to be positive. So if I now solve um, for uh, final velocity here, I'm going to erase this right here so I can read room. And uh, I get a final velocity of final velocity of one point two four meters per second, and that is positive, which means to the right. Okay. Uh, let's see. Does this make sense? Okay. If it goes two point two to the left, and this thing is you know almost twice as uh, more massive, then it should almost have a you know a little bit more than one half of the uh, velocity, which is, yeah, that's, that's, that's about right. The same concept can be used for a, um, you know, a gun and a bullet or something like that. When, when it's, you know, the bullet's in the chamber and ready to fire, you know, after the, you know, both the gun and the bullet has zero momentum. Uh, afterwards, all right, the bullet moves to the right uh, with a certain amount of momentum, which means the gun wants to move to the left, which is what you feel from that recoil. So, Okay, next up, Bob runs and jumps on a stationary wheeled cart. Bob has a mass of 75 kilograms, and the cart has a mass of 25 kilograms. The Bob is moving, if Bob is moving at 4 meters per second when he jumps on the cart, what is the cart speed after Bob jumps on? Pause and draw. What is happening? Okay, here's my before. Bob is moving to the right at 4 meters per second and is getting ready to jump on the cart, 25 kilograms, and this has an initial velocity of 0. 
I'll call Bob object one and this object two. Okay, now we've got to think about what happens afterwards. Okay, now after afterwards, Bob and the cart are moving. Bob is on the cart and um, are moving to the right at some final velocity. Um, so actually what we can do, uh, at the end, both Bob and the cart have the same final velocity. So we're, we'll have a way to deal with that as we, uh, as we get there. Um, but let's go ahead and write this. Again, Bob is object one and the cart is object two. So let's go ahead and write this out. So that means the total momentum initial, because there's no outside you know, net forces acting on the system. We ignore it. We're just talking about Bob and the cart. Um, total momentum object one is equal to, the, I'm sorry, uh, so it means the uh, momentum of Bob, which is the mass of Bob, and the initial velocity of Bob. And actually, let me, uh, let me erase that and go again. Let's do object one and object two. So the mass of a Bob, which is object one, and the initial velocity of object one plus the mass of object two and the initial velocity of object two must be equal to the final, uh, sorry, uh, mass of object one times the final velocity of object one um, plus the mass of two times the final, um, final velocity of object two. But what I know is that these two final velocities are the same. So what I can actually do is we don't have to call this, you know, that final velocity of one and two separately. Uh, I can just say, you know, final velocity. Okay. And so what I see is I can actually factor out that final velocity. So what I end up getting is mass one plus mass two and times some kind of final velocity here is equal to all of that there on the left. So I'll write, rewrite that real quick. Okay, so let's plug it in. Okay, so uh, Bob had a mass of 75, and he was moving, what did you said to the right? So positive 4 meters per second. This had a mass, of, cart had a mass of 25, uh, but was not moving anywhere, so this momentum here is 0. And then afterwards, he had the Bob and the cart uh, moving together at some final velocity here. Okay, so really what I did is treat you know, this as one, one uh, 100 kilogram uh, object. And I can do that uh, to begin with or to start with depending on the situation here. So, um, so this is gonna be 75 times four divided by 100. So this is gonna be a final velocity of three meters per second. And that's gonna be positive, which means to the Right, and again, we have to keep track of positives and negatives. Okay, so Bob was moving four to the right um, and jumped on something that was stationary. And what actually happened is that Bob slowed down, but the cart sped up. So Bob brought all the momentum into the collision or into the interaction. And then that had to be shared between Bob and the cart afterwards. Okay, another example. Uh, 30, 30 gram balls fired from a 1.2 kilogram spring loaded toy rifle at a speed of 15 meters per second. What is the recoil speed of the rifle? Before and after pictures. Okay, so here's my before. Uh, basically, I have a ball which is shown in blue that is part, you know, in, loaded into the spring gun. Um, and initially they are both at rest. So initial velocity of both of them is uh, zero meters per second. Uh, afterwards, uh, it's gonna be fired out. So, uh, but I did have to change the mass from 30 grams into 0 0.03 kilograms. Okay, so what happens afterwards is that the, <clears throat> the ball is now moving to the right, which means conservation of momentum means that the gun must be going to the left. And so if I need to find the recoil speed, uh, really what I'm looking for is this final velocity of 1, which I call the gun. So let's go set this up uh, mathematically over here. Okay, so... All right. Total momentum initial must be equal to the total momentum afterwards because there are no outside net forces interacting with my system, which is the gun and the ball. So I write down my momentum equation. And then I start doing substitutions. Well, 
to be honest, I'm going to skip some steps because I know that whole left side was zero because it was stationary to begin with, right? So it had no initial momentum, uh, which means it has to have no final total momentum afterwards. So I'm going to say, okay, uh, for mass one, this is 1.2 kilograms. Uh, this is what I am trying to find. And then mass two is 0 0.03. And I know it leaves at a uh, positive 15 meters per second. We just said that it was going to the right. Um, so that's going to be, okay, so I have to do 0 0.03 times 15. So that's a momentum of 0 0.45 and divide that by 1.2. And so my final velocity of the gun afterwards, otherwise known as the recoil speed, is 0 0.375 meters per second and that's actually going to be a negative value and then I have to say does that make sense okay well the gun uh, fires it and the gun's much more massive than the bullet uh, the bullet has a decent speed about 30 something miles per hour to the right uh, but because the um, uh, mass of the gun is much greater um, its velocity is going to be much 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 less than the bullet Okay, when we talk about the, you know, momentum being the language of collisions, um, there's something called elastic and inelastic, depending on their amount of energy conservation. And again, energy is in the next chapter, so it's um, something that we'll come back to uh, then. But the only thing you have to know right now is that there's a special kind of collision that we'll look at called perfectly inelastic. Basically, it's the idea when two things collide and they stick together afterwards. Okay, so two things are colliding and they stick together afterwards. Um, it could be something where they actually merge, um, or it could be something as simple as like two football players, like in this example, who collide and then they're wrapped up. You know, one guy's got a hold of the other one and they move at the same um, speed afterwards. And that's the most important thing: is that they move at the same velocity afterwards um, together. So here's our example for perfectly inelastic collisions. Two railroad cars with equal masses collide and hook together. The first car has a mass of 2 times 10 to the 4th kilograms and is moving to the east at 1.5 meters per second. The second car has a mass of 4 times 10 to the 4th kilograms, so twice as much as the first one, and is moving to the west at, the, at an unknown speed. After the collision, they move to the west at uh, 0.25 meters per second, what was the heavier, car, heavier car's initial velocity? So again, pause and draw. Okay, here's my before. Uh, you got the two times 10 to the fourth kilogram meters, uh, kilograms uh, moving to the right at 1.5 meters per second. And then you got the um, uh, four times 10 to the fourth kilograms moving to the left at some unknown uh, speed. So let's go to the after. Okay, so afterwards, it is moving at 0 0.25 meters per second to the left or to the west. Uh, so this is what my drawing would look like here. Um, and like we did before in a previous example, we can actually treat this as, you know, one mass. So essentially we have one mass of 6 times 10 to the 4th kilograms moving to the west at that much. So let's deal with this mathematically. Okay, so let's come back over here and do what we usually do here. So we'll start off with the conservation of momentum equation because there are no outside net forces acting on the system. Uh, so my total momentum initial has to be equal to my total momentum uh, final. 
Uh, so this is, I'm going to pause and write that out. Okay, so I wrote that out here, but you notice right here that I, uh, I did um, a combined mass and a, and a single final velocity. We had done that in a previous example, uh, but now we know that this is specifically a uh, perfectly inelastic collision. So we can apply that name um, if we needed to. So, okay, initially we had a, uh, let's start plugging in things, 2 times 10 to the 4th mass that was moving to the east at 1.5 uh, meters per second. And this one was moving, oh, sorry, this one was, let's see, mass 2 was 4 times 10 to the 4th, I'm sorry, my writing is getting bad here, uh, times, and oh, sorry, um, this is not final, let me erase some of this. Oh, it's not going to let me erase it, so I'll just scratch it out. This needs to be initial here. Um, and let's see, well, yeah, let me erase that one. Okay, so in my initial velocity of 2, and that's ultimately what I'm trying to solve for right here. Uh, my combined mass, oh, I already said that it was 6 times 10 to the 4th, and my final velocity um, was uh, to the west at 0 0.25, and the west is negative. All right, so make that a negative. All right, so let's solve for this. Uh, so 2 uh, EE4 uh, times 1.5. Uh, so on the left side, that's 30,000 right here. And uh, on the right side, I have 6 EE4 times uh, 0 0.25, and that's going to be negative. Um, and then i got to subtract that on each side, minus uh, 30,000. And then divide by 4 EE4. And so what I get is that initially, this initial velocity for the object 2 that was moving west was negative 1.125. Five meters per second. That means to the left. So the key thing is it's actually going slower. Uh, if I compare this and this, it's going slower than the other one. But because it has more mass, it brought in more negative momentum into before uh, into the collision. And so afterwards, you can think about it as it won. It brought in more, so therefore it won the battle. It is going to go west afterwards. Now for this class, um, one of the limits that they set is that we're not going to do two-dimensional collisions, but just know that you know uh, momentum is conserved for each axis independently. So like for more like a pool ball, something like that, then you would um, do conservation conservation of momentum initial uh, for x equals you know the final momentum in x, the final momentum in y, initial momentum y equals the final momentum in y. You just treat everything separately, like we have been doing with vectors, treating x's and y's separately. The last topic in this chapter will be angular momentum. Um, and it's going to follow our trend that we did uh, with all the other topics we did before with motion and forces. Now we're going to translate, um, you know, what we have for, you know, we translate linear force into torque. Um, translated mass into moment of inertia, velocity into angular velocity. We had acceleration into angular acceleration. So now everything that we're going to learn, we're going to translate also into angular terms. So linear momentum becomes angular momentum. Instead of momentum equals mass times velocity, our velocity is angular velocity. We no longer have mass, but moment of inertia, this angular inertia term. So just like how we say that momentum is inertia and motion, the desire for things to keep on going, and it takes some outside force to uh, change that, uh, we're going to have the same thing here with uh, angular momentum also. Uh, things want to continue to rotate in this case. We call this angular momentum. So it depends on two things. Instead of mass, it's a moment of inertia which we had calculated before using that table um, of things, and we could always keep uh, going back to that, and angular velocity. So what you know speed is it rotating? 
All right, those two things will determine how much it wants to continue rotating or not. So now we can uh, apply what we've um, also already know. So we know that so uh, angular momentum is the moment inertia times the angular velocity. And for a closed system without anything else uh, interacting with it, um, we have a conservation of angular momentum that goes on, which is my total angular momentum to begin with has to be equal to my total angular momentum to end with. All right, which is, you know, if I'm, let's say I have two objects, all right, each one has angular momentum, and they interact, then afterwards the angular momentum must be uh, the same. So, um, so one example that we can look at is something like, let's say there's a, um, and this is a bird's eye view, there's a merry-go-round like this, and that merry-go-round is not spinning. And some kid, this is a bird's eye view, comes and runs, you know, at, you know, three meters per second and jumps right on the edge, you know, of the merry-go-round right here. All right, so this is my before. And then after, you know, what happens? Well, after the kid is now riding on the merry-go-round, as it is spinning and I mean I could assign you know masses and radii and all that kind of stuff uh, before and after and so um, you, you may be a little bit and this could have mass also and so the way I would have to look at this is saying that okay this kid is um, is running right here and as he's running we say okay he has a linear momentum and that's true but it, we can also say that he has an angular momentum that's going on so essentially at all times he is some you know distance away right and you know he has some moment of inertia based off of some distance away from this pivot point and so essentially right here when he jumps on um, he has a moment of inertia that's just the, the radius or whatever. Um, and so he does have linear momentum, and he has angular momentum. Uh, before, this is not rotating, so it has zero angular momentum. Then afterwards, they have the same uh, angular velocity. But angular momentum must be conserved, so, you know, it's the same thing. This is almost the exact same thing as, like, a, um, a perfectly inelastic collision. Uh, but in this case, we're talking about a angular situation. Now, one more thing to add is that um, if it is not a closed system, if there is an outside force um, that is acting on an object, then what did we say before? We said that um, <clears throat> that impulse was force times time equals change in momentum well again um, in this case we're talking about angular momentum so there's a change in angular momentum so it's actually instead of force it's torque times time uh, and again force uh, torque is a force uh, r sine theta times time is equal to the change in angular momentum here so everything else can be uh, translated. So, you know, and if I have this same kind of idea here, uh, some kind of disk, uh, and I apply a, you know, force here, um, some distance r uh, away, and um, and I apply it, and I keep on applying it as this thing spins for, you know, ten seconds, then this force, this distance away, creates a impulse. And that impulse um, is not a uh, sorry sorry this force some distance away with this angle creates a torque and that torque and the time together creates an impulse which then changes the angular momentum of the system so it's going to speed up in spinning the way it spins another way that we can uh, conceptually apply this is uh, skaters and gymnasts 
or divers or whatever goes on. So if you look at the skater on the left, uh, you may see this in the Olympics. Um, they are spinning, and then they change their body shape, and all of a sudden they spin faster. So initially she has some kind of angular momentum here uh, that's going on. Um, some kind of angular momentum. And, but if I look at this, um, that's equal to uh, I W. Her initial angular velocity, because she has some angular momentum and a certain velocity that's going on. But what does she do? She ch brings her arms in, and all of a sudden she has a new angular momentum and a new angular velocity. So in this case, this has increased when um, when she brought her arms in. Now the thing is that this and this must be equal, right? Because there's no outside net forces acting on her. So what has to change in order for um, this right here to increase, this moment of inertia can actually change. And this moment of inertia actually decreases. All right, and the reason and that happens is because her arms are being brought in, all right? And so the, whenever you have more mass towards the center of something, the moment of inertia uh, decreases. You want to rotate uh, easier. And so in order to keep, you know, this the same, this angular momentum the same, all right, when this decreases, this has to increase in order to keep this value the same as that value. And so what I actually have is I have an initial angular mo um, moment of inertia and a final in uh, moment of inertia. You can also see it here with a diver, you know, jumping outwards. And as they tuck, they spin faster until they get to where they need. And then they straighten out and they don't spin as fast, right? You can see that in a diver. Okay, so here's our example for conservation of angular momentum. A 36-kilogram man stands at the center of a 200-kilogram merry-go-round that is rotating once every 2.5 seconds. While rotating, he walks from the outside edge of the merry-go-round um, two meters from to two meters from the center. What's the rotational period of the merry-go-round afterwards? Okay, so let's do our picture first. Okay, here's my initial situation here. I have my merry-go-round spinning. I just said that it was spinning counterclockwise. The merry-go-round itself is 200 kilograms. There's a 36-kilogram person standing right in the middle. And uh, di uh, the radius is 2 meters because it says eventually he walks out to the edge 2 meters away. So, um, And then it's, you know, so it's spinning. Uh, I'm not given this angular velocity, but I'm given a period. And of course, we should be... Uh, fine with going and finding that uh, here in a little bit. So uh, let's look at the after. Okay, now what happens is afterwards he uh, he's walked out to the edge, and that's caused um, some kind of change in angular velocity that happens. Uh, I can think about whether it's going to speed up or slow down. Um, the, the mass is moving. You got more mass distributed outside. All right, towards the outside edge. So um, what's happening is that um, it's going to, um, if more mass is on towards the outside, it's not going to rotate as much. So my moment inertia is going to increase, which means my angular velocity is going to have to decrease. So this should slow down, but we should, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Uh, first of all, let's go ahead and change our, um, let's go ahead and change our time of, a period of once every 2.5 seconds. Let's go ahead and change that to uh, angular velocity. I'll do that over here. Um, angular velocity is for one trip around is one trip around is 2 pi divided by the period. So that means the period is equal to 2 pi divided by the... Oops, that's not what I want. Let's go back. Um, I want, um, yeah, angular velocity is 2 pi, and that period was 2.5 seconds. So let's get, a, let's get a numerical value for that. 
is equal to 2.51, um, yeah, 2.51, that would be radians per second, is the initial angular velocity. Okay, so let's go over here and let's do our math the same way that we've been doing. So the sum of my initial angular uh, momentum must be equal to the sum of my final angular momentum. Uh, and I'm going to write this out. Hold on, I'm going to pause it. Okay, so it says my initial moment of inertia of object 1 times my initial angular velocity of object 1 plus the uh, initial angular momentum of object 2 times the initial angular velocity of object 2 must be equal to the final angular uh, moment of inertia of object 1 times the final angular velocity of, of the object, which is actually these two are the same. So I can actually you know, factor that out and just add those two together, which I'll do in the next step. Um, Okay, so let's just go ahead and so we'll call the man object one and the the merry ground the disc object two. So object one he can be treated as a point source, and so the moment of inertia of a point source is m r squared, where r is the distance away from this center. Well, the thing is, is that uh, the man has a you know a mass of 36 kilograms, but this distance is actually zero. So actually, he has an initial angular moment of inertia of zero. So it really doesn't matter. Here is his times initial angular velocity, which was 2.5, um, 2.51. But again, that goes to zero. So this is zero. So the man doesn't contribute to the moment of inertia or the angular momentum at all. Begin to begin with. Okay, now the disc, the disc has a initial moment of inertia for disc is one half m r squared. Um, the mass was two hundred, and the radius was two. So that's going to be uh, one hundred times. So that's four hundred and some funky units there, so we're going to ignore that. So, um, make sure that's 100, yep, so that's 400. So this is initial moment of inertia of 400, and it is going at uh, 2.51, make that real clear, 5, 1 uh, radians per second, and that's positive because it's counterclockwise. Okay, uh, now afterwards, Okay, afterwards, the um, the man, which is object one, mm, has a new, this is the initial of object one, and so it actually has a final for object one, the man, because he now is outside uh, of the center. So 36 kilograms is his mass, uh, but now he is two meters uh, out um, towards the outside. Okay. So, um, that's 36 times 4. So, 144, he actually has a moment of inertia now of 144. Okay, now, you see this final velocity here and here. I can actually factor that out, which I'll do, and put it out here. So, I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Uh, now, it says the next one is the final moment of inertia of object 2, which is the disk or the merry-go-round. Well, the merry-go-round doesn't change shape, um, so it's actually still 400. Okay, so now you see the setup. This is the only thing I have left. So 400 times 2.51, um, and that's going to be divided by uh, 544. So my final angular velocity is positive 1.85 radians per second. Okay. So it was going 2.51 and then it ended up going 1.85. So it actually did slow down. 
uh, but it's asking for the period, so let's go uh, as the last step over here and take this value. Okay, so if this is equal to 2 pi over the period, then the period is 2 pi divided by the angular velocity of 1.85. So that's 2 pi divided by 1.85. So it means a period now, it rotates once every 3.4 3. Um, 3. seconds. Okay, so it was rotating, what, every uh, 2.5 seconds, and now it's slowed down, so it rotates only once per 3.4 seconds. And the key thing is that if I looked at this, there was no, there were no uh, outside, uh, there were no outside forces or no outside torques that created an angular impulse that would change it. Again, it's just happening all within this system. And even just a person moving to the outside or something is all within that system. And it um, it doesn't affect the total angular momentum of the system. All right, if you had something complicated where both somebody walked out and somebody from the outside pushed um, to speed up, then it gets a little bit more complicated, but we're not uh, dealing with that.